as we read through the book of Philippians, particularly as we come to chapter 2, may we not just kind of look at it and just give casual, you know, just thinking about it a little bit, but may we be fascinated by the Savior, by Jesus. So that's our title, From Casual to Fascinations, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let's read that. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work amongst you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. What a wonderful statement. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense of and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you with all the affections of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may overflow still more and more in real knowledge in all discernment, so that you may discover the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and blameless for the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater purpose of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that, the most, and that most of the brothers and sisters trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Some, also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than, the, rather than from pure motives, thinking that they are causing me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. But not only that, I will also rejoice, for I know that it will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the, Holy, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ, he will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live on in this flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. But I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to, be, to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith. 
so that with your pride in Christ Jesus may be abundant because of me by my coming to you again. Verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you, and that you are standing firm in one spirit and in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but salvation for you, and this too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also, listen to this, to suffer on his behalf. <laughs> we don't like to hear things like that, do we? Experience the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. You know, though this be madness, there is method in it. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. That one might smile and smile and be a villain. The lady protests too much. Alas, poor Yorok, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow infinite jest. To be or not to be. <laughs> this is the question. Now you, if you're cultured and you like Shakespeare, you'll know that this comes from Hamlet. Sayings from the play called Hamlet. Hamlet is the most quoted of all the Bard's uh, works. But we're not going to be inspired by Shakespeare's words today, over the next couple of weeks. We are coming to a more ancient manuscript written in roughly 62, 63 AD. It wasn't written in England. It was written in a prison in Rome. 2,000 years ago. But just like Hamlet, Philippians is loaded with quotations that we really we, we get to know and we memorize and we, we meditate on. Let me see, uh, just a few. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion before the day of Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. In all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed. And of going hungry, having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. But inside these four chapters, when we come to chapter two, there's an incredible chapter. In there we see a portrait of Jesus. And he's portrayed as the humble servant. I can imagine in AD something or other, Paul in a dungeon, chained to, chained to a Roman soldier, penning these words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing about Jesus. And he sets to, he sets about to capture a picture of Jesus that's so compelling. It will move us from the familiar to being fascinated by Jesus. You're familiar with this lady. The Mona Lisa by the Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci. It's considered an architectural archetypal uh, masterpiece of the Italian Renaissance. It's said that it's the best known 
the most visited, the most written about, and the most sung about works of art in the world. The subject of the painting is an Italian noblewoman, Lisa del Giaconodo. Hope we got that right. Leonardo da Vinci never gave the painting to this lady or to the family. It was taken up by Louis II of France. Da Vinci spent years working on it. After his death, King, sorry, King Francis I of France acquired the Mona Lisa after his death, and it's now the property of the French people as it hangs in the Louvre since 1797. What's my point? Although this is maybe a lovely painting and it might give you sort of a, a, a mindful moment as you gaze at it, try and emulate that iconic smile. But the portrait of Jesus, it's not done with, with paint, not done on an easel, done on papyrus by a man in a prison cell. As you stare at the Mona Lisa, it might give you joy for a moment, but as you stare at Jesus Christ, as you look into his word, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, things will start to happen. Paul tells us that as we gaze at Jesus, the image of Jesus is reflected back to us. As if it was in a mirror, the more we look at Jesus, the more we are transformed into that image. And I quote, But we all, with unveiled faces, looking as if in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So as we look at another book, read, reflect, Meditate on it. Memorize the word of God. That's powerful. And see what the Holy Spirit will do as you find you've been transformed into the image of Jesus. Now, Paul's epistles, unlike Galatians, Colossians, Paul didn't write Philippians to sort of correct things that were going on in the church. Paul loved this congregation. They were special to him. Rather, it's a message of affection. It's a message of gratitude from a man that had founded the church in its beginning. You read the book of Acts, chapter 16, and Mike re uh, read that last week. It was the apostles' first visit to Europe, the first church established in Europe. And Paul went there because he had a vision of a man standing up, come over to Macedonia and help us, pleading. Now, was it an audible voice? Did Paul actually see it before his eyes? We don't know. The fact is, God spoke to him through a vision. He gets up, takes some brothers with him, gets on a ship, and he sails over to Macedonia to heed the call. Come over and help us. The city of Philippi is located about 10 miles from the coast. And the harbor, the harbor city, sorry, 16 kilometers, 10 miles, 16 kilometers from the coast. Neapolis being uh, the port city that Paul would have sailed into before walking the 16 kilometers to Philippi. Philippi was believed to have been um, founded by immigrants from Thrace. <laughs> you all know where Thrace is from. No? Okay. I'll tell you. It's modern southern uh, Bulgaria. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> you did. Thrace. Okay. The city of Philippi was rich in fertile land. It had gold mines. It had springs of water with, you know, fresh, wonderful water coming up from the ground. Could have been a gold rush that brought these people in to stay in that area. The town got its name, Corendis, meaning fountains or springs. 
That was his original name. Then 359 BC, thereabouts, it was renamed Philippi. Philip II of Macedonia renamed it. Now, you probably, unless you're a history buff, you wouldn't have heard of him, but you will have heard of his famous son, Alexander the Great. And he went into this place and really built it up, put it on the map, as it were, and it became the capital city of the Greek Empire. By the time Paul gets there, with his missionary journey, it was under Roman rule. There were Roman soldiers and their families everywhere. Population was also, there were Thracians, Greeks, and lots of Romans. A famous school of medicine was also in the area. Some say that Dr. Luke studied there. We don't really know. But extensive archaeological research and, and digging took place in that area over the years. And they've uncovered ruins, including a forum, lots of streets, gymnasium, baths, library, and an acropolis. Philippi exists today, but only as an archaeological site. The men that we, it was written for, long gone. They're ghosts in the area. And you can go to Philippi and walk the streets and have a good time. It also contains the temple of Apollos and Artemis. Paul traveled to Philippi. Silas went with him. Timothy went with him. And also Dr. Luke went with him. Paul's custom, as you know, when he, he, he went into a new place, was to go and find a synagogue. Go and find any Jewish believers that might have been in the area. And generally, they built synagogues by a river. And so on the Sabbath day, Paul went to the river, didn't find any men, he found a lot of women praying, seeking the God of Abraham. But it wasn't a synagogue. You had to have ten men in order to establish a synagogue. It's called a minion. So Paul goes there and he finds a lady called Lydia. Acts 16, verse 13. She was listening. She's from a place called Thyatira. And God opened her heart to listen to the gospel. She was a businesswoman. We're told she was a dealer in purple. Now, purple was a very expensive cloth. And I'll tell you why. In order to um, dye, get the purple dye, you had to get thousands of small murex snails. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and so it became so expensive. Only the royal families and only very rich people could actually wear the purple cloth. It was so expensive. But this is the thing. Lydia was a worshipper of God. She didn't know Jesus. And then Paul comes along with these other guys, and they start to tell her and the other ladies that are with her about the Savior. Let me read the verse. This is Acts 16, 14, and 15. And I quote, She was a worshipper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited them to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come, stay in my home. And she persuaded us. Lydia's conversion was the first of three significant events that we read in Acts chapter 16. The second was the expulsion of demons from a young slave girl that used to go around telling fortunes. She had the spirit of divination and Paul put up with it, you know, for quite some time as she was following them. These are the servants of the Most High God. And then he has enough. Come out in Jesus' name. And she can no longer tell fortunes. There's chaos. The guys lose their um, means of making money. 
Paul and Silas taken off to prison. That's what we read in Acts chapter 16. And when we come to the, book of the, the letter to Philippians, we roll on from there, Acts 16, we roll on 10 years. And actually three years since Paul's last visit to Philippi. And then we find the letter being read in the house churches in the area. When was the last time you received a letter? And I don't mean bills or, you know. <laughs> but a handwritten letter in an envelope and you recognize the writing and you're excited. Sharon received one on last Sunday. One of our granddaughters wrote a lovely letter to her and uh, put it in an envelope, name uh, and address. But you know, you get a letter like that and you can feel the paper rustling in your fingers and you anticipate what it says. It's generally good news. You can see the familiar strokes of the pen and you're thinking about the person that's written that letter to you. In fact, you can hear the person's voice in your head as you read it. And so you read Philippians and you, you get the personal, affectionate tones of Paul. And you notice that he doesn't call himself an apostle. Just, I'm your mate, I'm your friend. <laughs> Shows him the close relationship that Paul had with his churches. And out of all the churches that Paul founded, this was indeed his favorite. Philippi is the only one recorded to meet his needs financially. They also collected money for the poor people in Jerusalem. They were a generous people, which is what Phil says about you. Week by week, you are a generous people, and you are. He says, not only in giving of your money, but your time. Serving others and serving Jesus. And so this letter reflects the trust and the friendship that the apostles had, and Timothy, had with these individuals. Now, Paul's in prison, right? Imprisonment in Rome in those days wasn't a long-term affair. You're only in prison until your court case came up and... You were either killed with a sword or thrown off a high cliff. I'd rather stay in prison for a long time. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> and so you waited there until your trial or, or your execution. Debtors could be imprisoned until the debt was paid. If you were a Roman citizen, you were not harshly treated. If you weren't a Roman citizen, you were harshly treated. You had to provide your own food. And Paul would have had people coming in and, and giving him portions of food every day to keep him alive. He's there in prison. He's not been in contact with these guys for three years now. And then this man turns up. His name is Epaphrodites. He brings a gift from the Philippian church. He's overjoyed. But here's the rub. The man gets sick. And he's so sick, he's near death. But you read it, Paul says, Oh, God spared me that anguish and raised him back up to health. But it obviously extended his journey, so Epaphrodites is there with Paul for some time. And it's during this time that Paul starts to write to this church how generous you are. I'm so grateful for you. And the letter of Philippians is written and sent to them. I'm coming to a close. As we read this letter, we can get, we get used to Paul's style, his way of writing, his, his greetings. Don't overlook those. Don't think, oh, this is just kind of, you know, Paul's way of saying hi and goodbye. Every letter, every word, every sentence is inspired by the Holy Spirit and profitable for us for doctrine. Keep in mind as we read this, study this letter, this was a letter to real people, real living, breathing families, single people, 
that loved Jesus. And that's how the letter would have looked as it found its way to the churches, the house churches in Philippi. Imagine you in that home, probably on a Sabbath day, and this has been written to you, this has been read out to you. As you close your eyes and you listen to the words, you don't see the, the reader anymore, you're, you're seeing Paul, you're seeing Timothy there in front of you. It's going to be good, it's going to be God, it's going to be everything that you anticipate. And the, the words were not just kind of read verbatim, they're animated by the guy that's reading them. He's demonstrating it with actions, comes alive in the house churches. And it's not the reader's voice, but it's Paul's voice, it's Timothy's voice that you hear. And as you know, Timothy often occurs on the top of Paul's letters. He went with Paul lots of different places. It's believed that Timothy became the first pastor of the church in Philippi. So what I want to say to you is this. Read through the book of Philippians. Gaze at Jesus in chapter 2. Servant. Lord. Look at the style. Ask yourself questions as you, as you read through it. Paul's greetings on the first page. How does that differ from the style of leadership that we have in churches today? Paul, servant, slave of Jesus Christ. How does that differ from modern day leaders? Some of who love being served and not to serve. I just want to pray for you. Father, thank you for this book, this letter that was written so long ago. Lord, as we open these pages over the next week, weeks, months, I pray that these words will come alive. That they will work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would be changed into the likeness of Jesus. That we would become just like these guys, generous, hospitable, servants of the living God. And I ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.